Hey everybody, James Intracasso here. Just wanted to let you know that this episode of Tabletop Babble is brought to you by Cobalt Press. Cobalt Press, makers of fine 5th edition D&D products like the Warlock Patreon. Warlock is this amazing Patreon that gives you character options, adventures, monsters, new magic items, all kinds of goodness for 5th edition D&D. Uh, it's all set in the world of Midgard, but can really be brought to any campaign setting. If you like dark fantasy, you should go check it out at patreon.com slash Press. It is a really, really awesome thing. I am a member of this Patreon, and it produces so much amazing content from great game designers. So go check it out at patreon.com slash cobalt press. This is Tabletop Babble. I'm James Intracasso. Today on the show, I am talking with Stephanie and Craig about Kickstarter fulfillment. It is a really great conversation. I wanted to demystify the process of like what happens after you spend your money and a Kickstarter is successful. Where does it go? How is that money spent? And what goes on from there? Craig brought this topic to me and I was like, yes, this is really cool. The three of us are all going through this uh, and have been through this. And it is an awesome, awesome conversation. Uh, one that I hope demystifies the process for all of you out there and also helps any of you who may be planning on running a Kickstarter at some point in the future. And those of you who are just curious about the way it works. Here's my conversation with them. Okay, everybody, now I am here with two amazing designers. Before we jump into our topic today, uh, let's go around the table. Let me know who you are and what you do in the world of tabletop role-playing game. Uh, Craig, why don't we start with you as the returning member here on Tabletop Babble. Who are you and what do you do in the world of tabletop role-playing games? I'm uh, Craig Campbell. I'm the guy at Nerdburger Games. Designed a game called Murders and Acquisitions, designed another one called Capers that just went to Kickstarter uh, back earlier this year and is in post-Kickstarter production mode right now. Um, I've played, you know, RPGs for two and a half decades and uh, done a bunch of freelancing for other companies as well. And uh, that's what I do. Excellent. Well, it is awesome to have you here. I am also super, super excited to uh, get to know our next guest for the first time on Tabletop Babble. Stephanie, who are you and what do you do in the world of tabletop role playing games? So I'm Stephanie Bryant, and I wrote and I guess published a now uh, Threadbare RPG. It's a stitch punk role playing game where you play a broken toy in a broken post apocalyptic world. And my day job, I am the scrum master at Roll20. So I get to do tabletop stuff all day, every day, all the time. It's awesome. That's excellent. Well, uh, congratulations to you both for having successful products out there in the role-playing game market and for living your dreams. I am in the same boat with you in that uh, I have recently also had a, a Kickstarter that was just going on. And I am in the middle of Kickstarter fulfillment. And Craig, you brought this show as an idea of like, a lot of people know sort of what goes into the beginning and end or the beginning and middle of Kickstarters, right? There's a lot of planning. We hear people tweeting and blogging and podcasting, getting ready for stuff. All of the, everything that they've planned shows up on that Kickstarter screen, all of the pledge levels, all of the stretch goals, everything that they've got going. All of that is a lot of work. Keeping the excitement going is a lot of work. So after you have your successful Kickstarter, if things go well, you get your money, um, Kickstarter takes their cut, then what happens, right, is the question. And that is what we're here to talk about today, Kickstarter fulfillment. I think even if you are not a person who has a Kickstarter that you need to fulfill, this is going to be an interesting discussion because uh, it's cool to learn what goes into the back end of this stuff. We should sort of dive right in because uh, both of you have already done this. I am living this right now. Kickstarter fulfillment. Would you say that Kickstarter fulfillment 
Craig, is the like, is that when the work really begins? Is it more or less work than during and before the Kickstarter? I would say it's a different kind of work. You know, when you're when you're designing, you're designing and you're having fun and you're being creative and then you're getting in front of playtesters and your friends and there's feedback and you're redesigning and you're finding new things and there's this whole build. There's an excitement to making the game. And then when the Kickstarter itself is going on, it's the culmination of all that work. And it's so it's like, okay, now I'm asking all these other people, hey, do you think my game is really cool? Do you think this is a neat idea? Would you like to see it in a book form or a PDF or whatever? And, um, you know, that is inherently exciting because there's uh, there are real stakes. You know, this is the part of the movie where the where the where the good guy could really lose something. The stakes are real. Like this is like you're asking permission to make this game. Assuming everything goes well, you get funded um, a couple of weeks later, you get the money. And now it's like now it's responsibility time. Now it's time to uh, to to fulfill and get the the game out to the people who have shown faith in you and so there's an excitement to it because there's certain things that you don't do much of or at all early on like getting artwork you're getting more artwork um you start to see the book layout maybe you have to slog through you know maybe this is when editing is happening editing might have happened before but editing can happen afterwards too and so you're you might have to slog through some of the editing stuff which is maybe not the most exciting thing to you know have an editor come back to you and say hey look at all the ways you used a comma wrong and you have way too many m dashes you know so you 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 punch through all those things but there's there's a there's a a matter of finding like the little things in there that keep you keep 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 it excited the little milestones that kind of get you closer and closer so it's fun it's just a different kind of fun Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Stephanie, what about you? Do do you agree that uh, that it's just a different kind of work? Do you, did you feel like it was more or less work with Threadbare? Just absolutely, the the bulk of the work was after, and I say that having had I think four years before the Kickstarter of working on the game, um, but not working consistently. Just to be clear, I took a lot of time off. It's absolutely the production part of of making a book, making any book is a lot of work. So for, for me, this is not my first book. It's just my first game. So uh, uh, I had previously published comic books before. I've been, uh, you know, I've been an author uh, for other publishers before. So a lot of this process I've touched in different ways before. But without a doubt, um, this was probably my most ambitious project to date. And I've read a lot of advice that tells me that, of course, I did it all wrong by not having the book done before the Kickstarter. And I feel like that's mixed advice because on the one hand, uh, the less you have to do after the Kickstarter is over, the better, right? If you have all the artwork or at least the artists lined up uh, for after the Kickstarter, fantastic. If you have the layout already set up, fantastic. If you have the, all the text should be complete. Fantastic. But you know what I found? There were a lot of things that changed after the Kickstarter was over. And there were things that, uh, I turned to the community and I said, Hey, what do you guys think about this? And if everything had been done and locked in stone before I pressed launch on that project, nobody who backed it would be able to point at a page and say, I helped with that. You know, there's a there's a big value in not just being a backer who throws money at something, but being a backer who contributed an idea or a vote or, you know, helped shape how the game turned out. So for me, <laughs> that meant that that there is a lot of work after that after that Kickstarter funds that you're working on, you know, it's the artwork, it's finishing writing. Um, hopefully the rules are set, but I, you know, I, six months in, somebody emailed me and said, Hey, I've been playing your, you know, demo document. And did you know about this thing? And it, it was something that it was like, when you take it to the extreme, you, you are correct. That does sort of break the game. Either I fix that or I ignore it. Uh, <laughs> I guess I have to fix that. Um, so, you know, things like that happen and, and that's fine. That's good. It's healthy. Your Kickstarter backers are going to be the largest pool of, of play testers you will ever get. Um, or potentially I've, I have backed a, I've backed a lot of Kickstarters and, not all of them give preview documents. Not all of them give beta documents. And I can 
categorically say that the ones that do, there's a different feel to them. Um, there's a different, like, like you feel like they're listening, you know? Um, and that's really exciting to me. So, so that's why, <laughs> that's why post number one on my, on Fredbear is here's a link to the beta document. Uh, and, and you didn't even, people didn't have to even have to wait until the end of the Kickstarter to look at it. You know, you could back for a dollar and you could then back out. I didn't care. It was more important to me to get those eyeballs on that, on that game. So I think, you know, you've covered a lot of ground. And uh, one thing that I think you've touched on is how much work do you do in the beginning to make it easier for yourself on the back end? Uh, Craig, you know, this is something we saw with Capers, uh, your your latest successful Kickstarter. Congratulations. There's this interesting thing where it's like, well, I, you, like you said, Stephanie, the more work you do, the more work you're saving yourself at the end. But there's also what comes with that is the assumption that you will successfully fund, that you are essentially putting yourself in work debt if you are the one doing all of the work or real debt if you are paying some people to do the other work, right? Craig, you and I talked a bit about this a little bit because I did some work for you on Capers. That is, uh, people know that. You paid me for that work. But the, this was before you had months before you uh, went to Kickstarter. Um, so you to get that money back that you had invested in your product by paying me to write a couple thousand words, like you were relying on the Kickstarter funding, right? Essentially. Well, there's I looked at it two ways. You know, ideally, I want to hit the funding goal to get the base book or whatever the, you know, the slimmest version of the game was. That was kind of what I did with Capers was here's the slimmest version. And James's stuff, for example, was not part of the slimmest versions. That was a bunch of alternate stuff, kind of interesting, cool stuff that you didn't need to play the game, but could be a lot of fun. And so it became part of a stretch goal. And ultimately, I hit the stretch goals and added James's content and a few other people's stuff that they had done. That was expansion material um, that wasn't absolutely necessary, but helped to make the game better. I basically approached like the, the lead up time to that is kind of partly thought of it as, OK, I'm gambling on myself and and paying the money out to to get some st- to get some work done. And that included getting some artwork done up front and getting like a game titled logo, you know, a, a game title designed and a, a front cover designed and so forth so that you had things to show people. The projects that I'm working on are on a small enough scale that also I'm kind of thinking of things as like, if I wasn't spending this disposable income, because it technically was disposable, it wasn't causing me to like, you know, miss uh, house payment, you know, uh, uh, rent payments or utility payments or anything like that. It was money I had to spend. If I wasn't spending it on artwork and James, <laughs> I would have probably spent, you know, I wasn't designing games. I would have sent, spent it on other things. I would have bought more games or I would have traveled somewhere or gone to another convention or, you know, it, it's money that I would have spent. So I, I ultimately can make that money back via the Kickstarter. So I can kind of reimburse myself so that it's a net, you know, uh, a net zero or a net positive ultimately. Um, but you do, you do gamble on that um, when you're, you know, just like one or, you know, one person or a couple of people working on a game like that. And, uh, you know, that's just one of those things that you hope the, the backers realize, you know, in terms of the whole monetary thing and how you're gambling and doing stuff up front. And then also on the back end, too, it's like if you're. Uh, if you back a game or, or any product that seems like it has like a, a team, like a real, like a significant number of people, and there's a company that has multiple employees, that's a different beast. They, you know, they can put more effort into it if it's just like, you know, just little old me or uh, little old Stephanie <laughs> with uh, with a handful of contractors and friends that are kind of just punching the, punching things out. Then that affects, you know, where the Kickstarter, uh, how, the, how the fulfillment process goes. So. Um, there's, there's, it's a balancing act really is what it comes down to. It's what are you comfortable getting as much of this stuff done or doing it after the fact, how you present that in the Kickstarter. If you let the Kickstarter people know, Hey, everything's written or you let the Kickstarter people know, Hey, everything's not quite done. There's going to be some more stuff coming, but then you can also couch that in, but I'm going to give you what I have and people can play, te- you know, play it and, 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 and let me know if they find problems or things that they fi- uh, tell me the things that they find cool. So I'll make sure I do more of that cool stuff. Um, as I, as I, uh, fine tune the game. So it's all a balancing act. 
Yeah. Stephanie, it sounds like you were very happy with the way you did your project because it gave you flexibility on the end, right? You had the proof in the pudding that you had put out other books that you'd be able to get it done, right? Yeah. And I think that certainly that helped um, quite a bit. And I think one of the things that, um, you know, the up the upfront cost of doing a Kickstarter like this, aside from time, the actual hard costs, the money costs for me were um, artwork. I had some artwork for my Kickstarter, which I didn't actually really use in the book. Uh, it was artwork I had commissioned a few years earlier when the game was a little different and <laughs> like it was more combat oriented. <laughs> and when I, when I did new art for the book itself and hired artists for the book, um, one of the things that I kept going back to was I need the toys to not be carrying a lot of weapons, which was weird because like, you know, oh, we need a prop in this guy's hand. Okay, well, could it be a tool instead of, a, a you know, like a, a, a pitchfork, you know? So it was, it was hard. And one of the things that was, that's been my, my goal when I've done other, uh, I've now done two Kickstarters. I also did a, a comic book recently and, and I'm project managing for another friend who is going to do a Kickstarter probably later this year or early next year, which is plan your Kickstarter to make enough that, I mean, ideally you want to be making, you know, real profit um, <laughs> off of your Kickstarter. The best kind of profits. <laughs> plan, the, best, the best kind of profit is actual money in, in your pocket, but plan your Kickstarter so that at the end you have enough to fund those starting costs for your next project. And so, uh, you know, someone, someone like Craig, who's got multiple Kickstarters under your belt, I'm sure that some of the seed money came from a previous successful project, right? Well, it's one of those things that, yeah, it's like, you know, money that I spent previous to Capers is kind of, you know, money that I was, I'm okay with spending, but I, the capers, capers did well enough that I reimbursed that. And even if you calculated in the money that I reimbursed myself from previous, there was money left over. And like you said, that is, you know, that is, ear, that That's is the earmarked money. for artwork for the next thing. So let's then talk about like the actual process of fulfillment. You get your money, then what right like what is what is the next step so we know obviously finishing the product getting writing it getting it laid out getting the art and putting it into that layout all of that is is part of it but at what point then once once you've got that pdf ready to go and you've got you've got it ready to go to print like what are the what are the steps after that right like that because that i'll be honest is a mystery to me, and I am doing it right now. Sorry to everybody who's contributed to the Kickstarter who is currently panicking. So am I. Uh, so, like, <laughs> that's why James is picking yeah, our I was brains. Say, this is, uh, yeah, <laughs> I just turned a therapy session and a uh, a begging for help session into a podcast. So yeah, so what what is the next step? Uh, and luckily, I have a, a partner working with me who is John Four is really the person shepherding all of this uh I oh am, john's great yeah amazing an amazing human being who already knows how to do all of this stuff luckily and and really generous to the community i'd like to point out he he's really good about just sharing his knowledge so that's yeah if sorry i just you know i'm a fan uh <laughs> Oh, I mean, come on. Well, first of all, he's Canadian. So like, of course, he's generous and polite. But yeah, he's he's incredible. Uh, so so what 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 is the next step once you've got the product together in the in the PDF? What was your next step for Threadbare, Stephanie? Uh, so my next step. Okay, first of all, like going back to before that, uh, I set up with Backerkit way before, like w before the project ended. And the reason to do that is they uh, will often give you a discount on your fees if you set up before your project ends. And I already knew that I was probably going to want them to handle the sort of the the bookkeeping part of that. Um, sure. And what is what is Backerkit for people who don't know? Backer Kit is the, it's called a fulfillment service, but they don't actually do the fulfillment. But they are basically a um, a, a pledge manager, a, a method for 
uh, taking the data from your Kickstarter and making your, you know, your groups of, of backers so that you can easily email all of them at once. And so you can easily group them and say, I've shipped all of these packages. Or so you can deliver digital files to all of them through BackerKit. Not everybody is on drive through RPG. Not everybody wants to be. So having an alternate way for my backers to get a PDF was very helpful. It also sets up a store. So if you want to take pre-orders, you can take pre-orders. If you want your backers to be able to add on any uh, any additional products. Uh, I've backed a lot of Kickstarters, as I said. A number of them will have their other games available in their, in their um, backer kit. And so, you know, it's like I go to, you know, confirm my mailing address. And while I'm doing that, it says, hey, would you also like this other game that I made? And I'm like, well, I, well, I, hmm. I mean, you're shipping, you're shipping to me anyway. So maybe, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, you know, I often, I, there is a lot of money to be taken from Stephanie Bryant off of backer kit, uh, uh, add-ons after the fact. So backer kit's very useful in that regard. Uh, it has a few little things that, that, um, the interface can, can be overwhelming, but fortunately their customer support people are very helpful. So if you have questions, you just email them and they, they get back to you pretty quickly. My backer kit is already set up. Uh, I already have groups of who is getting what. And one of the thing, first things I do is I post my finished PDF to backer kit and say, Hey, you know, your drive through codes will be going out fairly soon, but in the meantime, here's the finished book. And then over on drive through RPG, I upload that file and get it ready to send out uh, the complimentary copies to backers. Uh, but I think what you're really concerned about is the print part, right? Uh, I, that is definitely part of it. So yeah, like how do how do we do print fulfillment as well? But I this is also important uh, delivering the PDF. Yeah. So for me, I did print on demand through drive through RPG. And I had my backers, the money that they paid me uh, was the complete cost of the book to them. So like they didn't have to get a coupon that they then spent at drive through RPG on an at cost book. A lot of people are doing it that way. I understand why people are doing it that way. It's just not the way I had had it set up. I had to buy, uh, you know, like 500 copies of the book to be shipped out individually to all these, all these different backers, which was, you know, was, uh, had its problems, but that, that, <laughs> that, that was, that's a whole nother. That's the next question. That's so the we'll, next we'll definitely get into that. Is what goes wrong. <laughs> so the first round of course, is you upload your print file and cover, which are different from your digital delivery file, right? Because what you need for print is different from what you need for digital delivery and their resolution of everything is going to be bigger and your, you know, all of your graphics are going to be um, split out and your layout guy knows how to do that uh, or gal, your layout person will be doing that for you. <laughs> and if you are the layout person, you should know how to do that. Uh, <laughs> um but uh, like you're doing CMYK channels and everything for your art and so you upload your your in interior file and your cover art uh, cover file, and then you wait. You order. Uh, you, you wait for them to approve it, and then you order it to get a proof copy. Uh, and then your proof copy arrives, and you've spent uh, as much as it costs to buy the book, uh, plus shipping, plus maybe expedited shipping if you're trying to get it out to Gen Con. Um, <laughs> and you look at your book, and you're like oh crap, there are problems with this book. And so you go through this whole process again. And, and you just, you do that with these, with these proof copies until you have a clean proof copy that you approve. Uh, at which point you can, you know, click the button and, and start uh, fulfilling. You can, you know, you could say list it for sale at that point. You could do what I did, which is make sure that all the backers got their copies first, et cetera. Um, that's using print on demand. Uh, there's also using like a regular printer, which I've also done for other projects, but I bet that Craig has as well. Uh, um, I and have not. I don't want to dominate. Oh, you I have, have not? I have not, oh, but I know okay. how it works. 
it, and, and because I know how it works, I do print on demand. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for, for regular print, for re- regular printing, um, you do have a very similar process. You have your cover art and you have your interior file. But in this case, you're going to send them to a printer and get a, a proof copy back, um, which you will then approve or say, I need this changed or that changed or whatever. And, uh, and then you will order and pay for anywhere from 100 to 5,000 copies of your book. If you want that price to be reasonable, it has to be at least 500 copies at, for most printers and for, for most books that you're doing. There's, there's variations. There's certain things you can do cheaper for smaller runs. But most yeah. of the people you're going to talk to, if, you know, to try to make a decent price point that you're paying, you'll, that's, 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 that's one of the, just a quick aside. That's one of the reasons you see very small publishers with just like little imprints, little games will gravitate more toward print on demand because they don't have to order 500 or a thousand copies um, and stock, you know, and, and store those somewhere in their home and, and deal with shipping or put them in a warehouse and have somebody else fulfill. And it's, it's all sorts of extra hassle. That's just a, an, an aside on that. Yeah. I, you know, um, that 500 copy number, I would agree with you, except that I just had a 100 copy print run that went very nicely. You found a unicorn. I did, and and I will I will happily share the the website. Uh, it's kenes dot com, k e n e s s. They do fairly short, uh, fairly small runs. It, it, the price point isn't as great as if if I did uh, five hundred copies, but it was better than doing a hundred print on demand. So you know, it's it's it was a happy medium for what I needed. Threadbare had about five hundred backers. I probably could have could have gone with. Um, with a regular publisher, you know, regular printer like that. Um, I didn't want to hassle with the, um, with the shipping part that that's where, that's where I, I ran into, I was like, I work full time. I don't want to spend five weekends shipping books. I would rather have somebody else do that. Following up on, if you want to have uh, a thousand copies of your book in your closet, I currently have probably 2000 copies of my various comic books in my closet. Uh, at every every independent publisher that I know who has done regular publishing like that has a few thousand copies of whatever it is sitting somewhere. Oh my goodness! Well, yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, go buy Stephanie's stuff so that she can move some product <laughs> out of her closet, have space for her coats again. Also, because it's good. Uh, that's another good reason to. Craig, you've done, and uh, we did this as well with Demon Plague. We did the print on demand. But no, you buy the book at cost later. Can you describe how that process works? Yeah, well, there's a couple, you know, there's there's different ways to do the print on demand thing. Um, and you'll see this in different Kickstarters. People, different people will do it differently. There's the 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 off the normal offset print run, which is the big printing press, which we talked about. That's where you a lot of times they, they print a lot of copies and you get a thousand copies in your closet. But then with print on demand, you can end up with as the creator, you can work shipping into your backer levels. Or have the shipping covered separately through uh, one of the pledge manager services like Backer Kit, and, and then you just you know in your Kickstarter when it says you know we'll charge shipping after, ch- you know afterwards. That's usually how that's done. But then that requires you to kind of takes if if you keep it in your own Kickstarter in in your backer levels. Now you have to kind of guess. Well, how many people do I think are going to order this from Australia and Brazil? Because Australia and Brazil are incredibly. Um, expensive to ship to. If everybody's just ordering from the U.S. and the U.K. and uh, you know a, a few choice countries in Europe, you're probably you know it's easy to to estimate. But once you get into other parts of the country or other parts of the world, it can be tough. There's a lot of you know f- uh, budgeting you know and 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 uh, planning f- uh, for extra money to kind of be set aside in case you need it in order to cover shipping costs. That'll happen. Um, I personally have found. A good way to do it so that I don't have to keep a stock in my house and spend time shipping because like Stephanie, um, I have a full time job. I also live in an apartment and I don't have, you know, I, I, I have a lot of geek stuff and I don't have a lot of extra space to devote to, uh, you know, a thousand copies of a book. I hear you. Less less space for role playing game books because you already have too many role playing game books. I, I want a thousand. I want I want one thousand different role playing right, game books. Yeah, exactly. In my apartment, <laughs> um, so it's it's a question of doing the uh, the print on demand um, after the fact, where you give the uh, backer 
as part of one of the backer levels, they will get a, a discount link that'll take them to drive through RPG and allow them to get the game book for, you know, five bucks, seven bucks, 10 bucks, 12 bucks, maybe 15 bucks. If it's a big book, you know, whatever it costs to just put the, to put the colors on the page and to put the right kind of cover on it. Plus the, you'll put, plus they pay for shipping then. So anybody that's in a different part of the world, um, they have to deal with, you know, whatever the shipping situation is there. And, and people who back Kickstarters from Australia, <laughs> I've, I've seen many complaints. They understand it's, it's a giant pain and uh, international shipping is, is rough and, you know, rates change sometimes, sometimes dramatically and sometimes without warning. So that's the, you know, the, I found that to be a happy medium as far as alleviating some of the concern for me, the creator and some of the time and extra effort and put it into the hands of, of the backer. I know that it loses backers for me. There are some backers who they would, they want to just pay one set uh, chunk of change right now. And it's going to cover everything. It's going to, and then someday the book's just going to show up. Some are a little okay with like, okay, I'll, I'll back for this level now and I'll deal with the backer kit later because it'll be, I'll be prompted for it. Like somebody's going to send me an email. That's going to say, Hey, go here and pay for your shipping. The, the upside to it is that it is super cheap. Um, it gets you a book in a, in a PDF. You know, usually if, if the creator is being not good about it, gets it to you for a really good price. It's going to be significantly cheaper than it will be for retail later. Um, and uh, just requires a little more effort on the backer's part. And print-on-demand printing, while it is not of the quality uh, as far as the printing and as far as the binding of offset demand printing, it's very, very good. And it has improved dramatically in the past several years. If anybody ever uh, ordered print-on-demand stuff from drive through and their printing partner, Ingram, from like six, seven years ago, it was a little, mm. <laughs> you, you weren't always too guaranteed, but it's, I have yet, you know, in the last maybe four or five years, I haven't received a print on demand book from Ingram that I've been really dissatisfied with. Occasionally there's a little something that shifts, not quite right. It doesn't end up on the page perfectly, but that's what your safety zones are for. And when you lay out artwork, there's a certain zone that you can put everything in and you have to be careful. You don't want important stuff too far to the edge because it might get trimmed if the image is shifted slightly. Um, when it gets printed. Yeah, the old title safe we have in, in TV because you never know what dimension someone's TV is going to be. So there's a certain like, hey, if you're going to have text on screen you want the viewer to read, keep it with among these lines, right? Yeah, it's a similar kind of thing. Video geek. Video geek, everybody. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that's that's kind of you know a lot of what happens there. But there's in between the Kickstarter – and this process of set, you know, getting a book printed, which we've now kind of touched on, there's a, a or getting, you know, let's expand it, gaming, getting a board game or a card game into your hands. There's a lot of other steps in between there that can run a little longer than you're expecting, and you can run into delays. And you know, just as a as a plea to the to the backers and the future backers out there listening um, on this podcast, be as forgiving as you can, and and if the creator is being upfront. Because we've all run into back, you know, to Kickstarters that have run long, that have taken a longer time than expected to, to, to fulfill. But, you know, I personally am very forgiving if the creator is very upfront and keeps me up to date and says, you know, well, hey, this, this and this happened and it's going to delay me by this much. And uh, I'm like, all right, OK, I can I can hang in there. They're being honest. They stuff happened to them that they couldn't control. Or maybe, you know, if there's something that they could control, maybe I'm just kind of thinking, well, lesson learned, hopefully, for next time around. I, I, I considered myself fairly forgiving with Kickstarter backer or Kickstarter creators in the past. I am, now that I've done it one, one and a half times, I am a really forgiving um, Kickstarter backer because I, I see the delays. I know that stuff can crop up. Don't go anywhere. There's more Tabletop Babble coming up. All right, so my bosses James Intercast and Rudy Basso asked me to record a commercial for the Newbie DM Minicast, my new 5-10 to 10 minute podcast aimed at giving Dungeon Masters quick nuggets of advice. But I've never cut a commercial before, so let me see what I could do. <clears throat> Best radio voice? All right, Newbie DM here inviting you... Oh, oh wow, that's terrible. Hello, uh, Newbie DM here inviting you to join the Minicast... <laughs> wow, that's bad. This sucks. I'm never going to get this commercial for the Newbie DM Minicast done, and James and Rudy are going to be mad at me. You know what? Let me just put this aside for now and get back to recording another episode of the Minicast where I give out some hot DMing advice and I'll come back to the commercial later. Sorry, James. Sorry, Rudy. It's not going to happen right now. All right, back to the show.
So this is a great, great question, which is how do we handle things that we didn't plan for? Craig, you know, you've you've mentioned a couple times setting money aside for uh, changing shipping costs and things like that. You know, I read Rob Schwalb uh, when he was working on Shadow of the Demon Lord decided to add you know, 12 pages to the book and those 12 pages increased his shipping cost 25% because all of a sudden he was in the next tier of mailing with the weight of the book and all that kind of stuff. Like how, how do we handle these? You know, Stephanie, you've alluded to some mistakes as well. Uh, I wouldn't say mistakes, sort of un- unforeseen circumstances is probably the better way to put it. Uh, with Threadbare, uh, you know, you can't control everything. Uh, how uh, how do we deal with that? How do we how do we plan for the things we can't plan for? I'm going to answer with two hats. Uh, one of them is the Threadbare hat, in which uh, basically basically that trim problem that Craig was talking about. <clears throat> So that happened to us, and you're you're welcome. Yep, I I back Threadbare. I remember that. I yeah. figured that's something that's worth talking about. It's a, it, a good lesson. It was it was a it was a huge uh, it was a huge deal um, because uh, in this case I had an approved proof, I had a print run that had been correct, and then I pressed the button to print and ship to I think it was 177 backers, all of the. Uh, all of the soft cover color backers. So the bulk of the print backers. And so far as I can tell, every single copy, uh, the page numbers were trimmed off. And it was a, it was a huge hassle and we went back and forth and among other things, we needed to fix uh, the PDF because we said, okay, obviously the safety margins are an issue because we can't get a clean copy out. Uh, And this was, you know, every every country like that i had shipped to i had people in the uk and you know they ingram has a a printer overseas so their actual printer is a different printer than the one fulfilling the us customers so obviously this was a systemic problem obviously something had changed i don't know what and uh, so we, you know, we went back and forth. We did a number of more, you know, several more proofs. I've got a stack now of proof copies just of Threadbare, most of which uh, failed. And then finally, we got uh, we got things sorted out. We got it to do a clean print. It's still a little close, but it seems to it seems to print pretty consistently now. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm going back to Ingram and saying, or going back to Drive Through and saying, I'm I'm sorry, like I feel like I did my due diligence on getting this, uh, getting a clean proof. And, and what I got is not what I, what I ordered. So um, what are we going to do? Drive through really stepped up. And this is one of those cases where dealing with a smaller company is better because Ingram, (laughs) Ingram said too bad. (laughs) So sad. And drive through said, "Let's take care of this customer." So they are, they are top notch. They've earned my loyalty for sure, and um, and I love them. But uh, but it was a really really hard uh, hard period of time because I was like, I, you know, even even what margin I had set aside for errors was not set aside to reprint basically the majority of <laughs> of the books. <laughs> So, and my goal in doing the Kickstarter was not to make a ton of money, but even so, like, like having, having that padding eaten up was, was really rough. And it was, and it was at the very end of a project where there had been a few other delays. I had a medical issue that, that, um, that delayed me. I had an artist disappear for about six months, um, which it, that happens. Uh, this is not the first time I've had an artist disappear, uh, on a project and, you know, you get to a point where you're like, hey, I either need you to respond to me or I need to replace you. So which is it? That does happen once in a while. And because life happens. And I, I for one, am the kind of person who, uh, just like Craig is really forgiving of, of Kickstarters uh, nowadays, I'm very forgiving of other creators because I have had terrible burnout in the past and I know how crippling it can be, you know. Um, and I, I know what a medical issue can do. And I know, you know, what just, just 
any financial insecurity can do. And when you're a freelancer, everything is financial insecurity. So uh, anyway, so for, so for Threadbare, we had a, there were a lot of lessons learned uh, and lessons to be learned. And I said I'd answer this from with two hats. And that so the one hat is just like really like smile a lot, even while I was dying inside um, because, because I was so worried and so scared that this was just going to bankrupt my, my kicks, you know, my, my little project budget. But at the same time, I had to talk to the backers about it. Uh, And this is, this gets back to what Craig said, which is that you have to be in communication with your backers. And my, my goal when I started Threadbare was to communicate with the backers at least once a month. And I did a pretty good job of that. Uh, I was fairly consistent near the beginning of the month. I would say, oh, I haven't talked to the backers. Uh, You know, it's the 6th of June today and I haven't posted since about the 5th of, of May. So I better say something. And so I would. Uh, even if the even if the message was we have I have nothing to report or I'm just getting you know more stuff or uh, I spent the last month going around and around with proof copies and I don't know how long this this error this issue is going to take. <laughs> the backers are very forgiving if you are very transparent. That that is absolutely that is absolutely true. That is a culture that Kickstarter has um, has instilled. Uh, disappearing for a year and then posting is not the way to go. Uh, and I've, I've had, I've, I've seen that happen with a lot of Kickstarters. I've seen that happen with Kickstarters that friends of mine have done. And I, you know, I feel for them because I know that they didn't disappear for no reason, but I also know that their backers are, you know, with every month they get angrier and angrier. So it's, you know, it's important even, even if what you have to say is, Hey, I can't deal with this right now. That's a thing. That is at least a thing that you've said, and most people are understanding to a point. And just just a quick quick aside on that, um, as far as being uh, you know transparent and open with the backers, and you, you commented, uh, Stephanie, about you know people if if you go too long they'll complain. Just creators to keep in mind, not for pe- you know backers don't take advantage of this, but creators you know can keep in mind that um, the reason that they're getting angry sometimes is because they're terrible people um, and they're just going to complain because there are trolls on the internet. But a lot of the time it's because they're passionate and really like the project and want to see it happen. Um, so, so as long as you're talking to them, they're going to, they're going to be much uh, better with it. Yeah. They, they'll still be passionate, you know, and they'll be passionate and happy. Um, so you can have them passionate and, and angry or passionate and happy, or at least patient. And and have them passionate about a creator that is very communicative. Like the next time something comes up or somebody asks about, hey, I'm thinking about backing this project by Stephanie Bryant. And the person says, you know, she had some problems with the last one, but she got it done and she was she, she kept us up to speed and everything and everybody was happy in the end. You know, that's that's another thing that like builds your cred as a designer or a creator. Yep. Um, and so I wanted, I, I did say I had two hats to answer with, and the other hat is the project manager hat. And this is like the, the, you know, career project management type of thing. And when one of the things that a project manager is supposed to do when they set out their project plan is you build into the plan for time and money and even personnel, what you will do if things go south, you have a contingency plan for everything that you could think of that poses a risk to your project. Um, I did not have that when I started Threadbare. I did have it by the time I finished Threadbare. (laughs) Um, And I had it when I made the next project that I made, which was the comic book. Uh, I will have it for the next project that I work on. Um, It will not cover every possible risk to the project. And the main reason why is I can't possibly think of every possible risk to a project. I had things happen in Threadbare I didn't, I would never have expected, but it's possible to plan for some things. You can plan for what do I do if the postage goes up? You can plan for what do I do if, uh, you know, one of my, my contributors disappears. You can plan for things like, what do I do if drive through RPG stops accepting my work? Uh, which can happen. Uh, you know, drive through is, you know, fortunately they're not the only game in town, but they're, but they, you know, they're a private company. They could just 
decide I don't want this person on my platform. <laughs> what do you do? Um, so you have to you have to think about what are your contingency plans. Kickstarter has a space for risks and challenges. You don't have to put every single one of those risks in there, but it's good to put it's good to put the top five as like I have thought about these things. I have thought about these things that are common issues with other similar projects. And here is how I would deal with them. And then make sure that you have the budget to deal with them in that way. Um, I, I, I always like to say that uh, when you're working on a project, you have uh, equipment, people, talent, whatever, time, and money is the thing that you use to shore up any one of those that you lack. You know, we talk a lot about like money with the Kickstarter, but the money is is a stand in for those other things because like you you pay somebody to do the thing, you know, to to make the art. You pay somebody to write something that you could have written. It wouldn't be the same, but you could have written that thing. You pay for someone else to wrangle with Adobe InDesign, like you, you know. So you could have, you could spend that time doing things in Adobe InDesign, and and you know, take five years to learn how to use it correctly and everything. Or you could hire somebody who already has that skill. And so money is is if that's I always think in terms of money is my stand in for uh, the skills and talents and time that I personally lack. Sometimes if, you know, if you find yourself pressed for time, if something, if one thing delayed everything a bunch and you've got some other things that need to be done, you can pay people more to do it faster and to, and to forego their, uh, maybe they don't take, you know, uh, that weekend off, or maybe they, you know, they, they put a little extra time in each evening and just say, Hey, I'm, I'm willing to throw a little extra money your way to crunch this thing out a little faster. I know your deadline is a month away. Can you do it in two weeks? There is uh, one thing that terrifies me uh, specifically about print fulfillment, which is, uh, well, there's a lot of things. There's one one thing we haven't touched on yet that terrifies me, which is, uh, so I've, I've delivered PDFs. The great thing about PDFs is, oh, look, here's a typo or here's a thing you screwed up. Uh, well, here's a new PDF. Everybody's happy, you know? How many times... <laughs> Should I be reading over my PDF, my uh, my thing before I send it off to the printer? Craig? I know this answer. You should read it one time just to satisfy your own personal curiosity, but you will miss things. You should get a proofreader. Mm. You should not depend upon yourself to, to pick up uh, the, the, the problems in terms of technical editing, in terms of... Um, is this sentence structured properly? Is is this paragraph flowing to get the information across? Spelling, capitalization, any of that stuff. You will miss things. You are too close to it. How long did you spend writing Demon Plague? Uh, a year. <laughs> it, I, I could put a paragraph or two of Demon Plague in front of you and take a word out. Mm -hmm. Make the sentence nonsensical and you will miss it. Yeah. Because you know that that, that that the word in needs to be in the middle of that sentence. Mm -hmm. Proofreader, editor. Yep. Absolutely. And then you should have a website mm. on which you mm -hmm. will put errata. <laughs> <laughs> That's one approach. It is. The other, the, there, there's, I mean, and this is just me personally. Um, I don't make games that are so incredibly robust that, you know, something would necessarily, if something were to break down in one of my games, my, okay, that, that like you found something really broken. Maybe errata, okay, but for the most part, I'm like, you know, if there's a spell, if there's a typo in there, if a typo slips through, if there's a if there's a little something in the rules that, uh, like, if somebody really twists the meaning of the word or or the sentence and tries to utilize this particular rule in a certain way, they're gonna, you know, bend it for their own personal advantage in some way. You kind of have to just be okay with that as the designer. I changed a a rule in Threadbare after printing and that and it was like your first edge case there of of if somebody if it's a rule that's going to break the game it broke the game and it was and it slipped through and and i missed it and my editor missed it and it was just like oh realized it afterwards i was like i need to take that out okay well i guess there's going to be some copies out there with a with an error oh well <laughs> those will be collectible yes mm -hmm. the gen con collectible <laughs> copies <laughs> also the the print error those are now collectible too 
Yeah. The, uh, the artwork or the, uh, the, the error situation, um, you know, just as a creative, it's, it's never going to be perfect. It's just not. And so resign yourself now to that fact. Perfect is the enemy of done. Um, you resign yourself to that fact and you will save yourself a lot of headaches. I mean, fix everything you can. Absolutely. But at some point you have to let your baby run off into the wild and stand on its own two feet and let other people play the game, wipe your hands of it and move on to the next cool thing that's percolating in your brain. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got time for one more question. And my big thing I think is why is it good for people who are backing Kickstarters to understand how the fulfillment process works. Obviously we've talked about like it keeps them happy, but like on a deeper level, why do we want people out there to understand what we as creators are going through other than that they will take it easy on us (laughs) when things don't go right. I know like for me personally, I just love to know how the sausage is made and it it certainly makes me yell at people less but it also makes me appreciate the thing that i get more and uh and understand why people are asking me to pay for print on demand vouchers and why things cost what they cost right i think is a is a big thing for me what about all of you like what, what are you hoping the listeners take away from this chat uh craig let's start with you well, you kind of hit on what I was going to say, James, um, which I mean, I think it's it's useful for anybody who's in a particular hobby to have an understanding of how the thing that they love gets made. It doesn't mean that they necessarily are prepared to design their own uh, their own game. But if you think about, you know, they, they know enough about like, you know, the, the, the effort that goes into game design and the multiple people that are involved and you've got different people in different roles and designers and editors and layout and artwork and graphic design and so forth. It reflects, think about other hobbies, you know, somebody who is really into cars, they don't necessarily, they can't necessarily build an internal combustion engine, but they know how it works. They know everything about how that car goes together. They know a lot of bits and pieces. They probably know a lot of differences between different types of cars. What makes this car hard to produce? What makes this car? Why is this car so relatively easy to produce? What's the what's the thing that gets in the way? You know, what, why why was this car a little wonky? You know, what was the, the 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 design flaw or the thing that was in there? I mean, I think that's that's not really that different for anybody that's in, interested in another hobby. Like, in, if you're into RPGs, you're going to over time. Um, and with and and even over a shorter time with some effort, learn a little bit about you know what it what it takes to make that hobby happen in terms of the history of the of of game uh, RPGs and game design, and then the you know practical like this game here being designed and what it took to make all of that. And it, it gives you a deeper appreciation. It makes you love the hobby more. It makes you want to share the hobby more. And, um, and, and then that is ultimately healthy for the growth of the hobby. So there I took understanding Kickstarter fulfillment to growing the hobby. I'm out. <laughs> yeah. Da, well, da, thank da, you. Da, 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 da. <laughs> uh, it's, Stephanie, what about you? What do you hope the, the listeners take away from this? I, I, I kind of is going to piggyback on growing the hobby. Um, but, but from the direction of, if you have an idea and you are thinking, um, hey, this is this is a fun whatever that I've made uh, and I wouldn't mind sharing it with the world, backing Kickstarters and watching how people do this and fulfill their Kickstarters is probably the least expensive research that you can do into the industry of publishing. Uh, the, <laughs> like you can back for a dollar. And I, if I were, if I didn't have um, way too many Kickstarters already uh, on my profile as having backed, um, you could go and just take, say, twenty five dollars, and back twenty five over the course of like, like say six months, back twenty five RPGs or games that are similar to what you think you want to make. So if you're like, hey, I want to make a setting for OSR, or hey, I want to make a you know Powered by the Apocalypse game, or hey, I want to do something in Fate, or I want to make my own thing, and these are the kinds of people who would buy it. 
so you go out, take your $25 and back 25 Kickstarters for $1. So it's your, it's your, I'm just going to get your updates backing uh, price and just pay attention to the updates. See what the, see what the creators are saying, see how often they talk to their backers, uh, see how often, see what kinds of information they give, read the comments, see what people say. You know, if you backed one and they don't respond and they don't say anything for, for like five months, go look at the comments on the last post that was made and on the open comments and see at what point people start getting antsy. You know, and you will learn more about how to communicate with with your backers than than anything in the world. I probably backed about a hundred Kickstarters before I launched Threadbare, and it was it was one of the best market research and best you know methods of okay how now you don't get the full behind the scenes you're not going to see all the work that goes into you know setting up everything that they're talking about uh but it's a it's a very valuable tool for seeing that interaction between between the kickstarter and the backer and and that that someday could be you uh, so I feel like if you, if you're listening to this and you're getting this, you know, sense of like, okay, well, what would it actually take? Pod, you know, print on demand is, is not that expensive. I could do that. Um, things like that. And you're getting some, some creative ideas. Uh, you know, that to me, to my mind, that is growing the hobby. That is, Hey, we could have more voices out there with their creative ideas in the marketplace. There's some exciting things that we could be seeing uh, as as you know, Kickstarter has really matured, and RPGs in general, especially indie RPGs, are in this flourishing marketplace right now. Um, and it's lovely to see. It's lovely to see what I consider like phase two of design of, of these designs coming out. You know, there's, there's been Monster Hearts 2. There's been Apocalypse World 2. There's, you know, Legacy, uh, Life Among the Ruins 2 just came out. Like all a bunch of these, these products that came out a couple of years ago are now sort of having their, we're now in our second edition. We've, we've learned a lot. We're making something new. And as designers, their their creators have developed too, and now the people who are learning from those designs, you know, are going to stand on the on the shoulders of those giants and make something even bigger. And I am really excited to see how that how that happens and what happens next. That's going to be awesome. Well, thank you both for joining me today. Before we go, Craig, where can people find you? Um, just a quick note to to expand on uh, uh, Stephanie's comment about if you want to make your game, like you know, learning all that stuff <laughs> helps. You know, le- following a bunch of Kickstarters will 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 learn you a whole bunch of stuff. I would just like to uh, encourage you that um, if you don't think your game idea is interesting enough, and that there's going to be people that want to buy it, I made a game about beating people up in an office and I got 250 people to buy it. So they will buy absolutely anything. <laughs> there's, if you can think of, and I yes, was if, one you can of them, think, if you can think of the game, <laughs> there's an audience for it. So give it a shot. Um, as far as where you can find me, the other game capers, which is a super powered game of gangsters in the roaring twenties is in production right now. It's on backer kit for pre-order. So if you missed the Kickstarter, you can get, uh, the same $15 base buy-in deal, which pretty much gets you everything um, with that uh, discount link to get the book purchased later or or not. If you just want a PDF, you can get that $15 for the, uh, for the game and all the other support stuff that goes with it. So you can go look for that at Backer Kit or just go to the Capers Kickstarter page and there's a button, a blue button that you can press and it'll take you there. Super awesome. Got the greatest GM toolbox chapter of any book ever written. <laughs> and you can go to <laughs> nerdburgergames.com to hear me talk about stuff, including Project Thunderhawk, which is coming some days. Um, that's that's the code name for the thing that's underway now. And um, I am at Nerdburger Craig and uh, on the Twitters. Excellent. Well, thanks for being here. And Stephanie, where can people find you? Uh, threadbearrpg.com is the main website for Threadbear. Uh, I'm also, it's also on drive through RPG and on, um, indie press, uh, revolution. Um, 
I am Mortain on Twitter and pretty much everywhere else. Uh, there's a few places where I'm the real Mortain because somebody got there first, but, uh, but they're the <laughs> fake Mortain, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I am Mortain on, uh, on a number of platforms, you know, always happy to hear from people. My, I don't have a company name. Um, I used to have a corporation and I decided that I just wanted to be me. So it's just under Stephanie Bryant. <laughs> You can find me on, uh, like I said, on Twitter, on Facebook, uh, on Google+. Plus. I'm, uh, most of my game design stuff is over on Google+. Plus. So if you are looking to talk about games or hear me talk about games, that's the place to look for me. Awesome conversation. We really uh, had a lot of fun talking about Kickstarter fulfillment. People, I wanted to let you know that DSPN has a panel at Gen Con that's free. If you're going to Gen Con, head on over to GenCon.com, search for DSPN in the events, and get free tickets to our Q&A panel, which will feature me, Rudy Basso, members of Venture Maidens and Dames and Dragons. We'll be giving away prizes to people who ask questions, and we'll reveal the location of our secret after hangout where you can buy food and drinks and just chill with us it is gonna be a lot of fun and if you want to know more about the game design stuff i'm doing follow me on twitter at james intracasso and head on over to worldbuilderblog.com Tabletop Babble is a show on the Don't Split the Podcast Network. Thanks to Rudy Basso for founding it with me. Our theme music, which you're listening to right now, was provided by Battle Bards. Don't forget that RPGs are like sex. Beware of paper cuts. Party 13, let's suit up for adventure. They're the only ones that can save the world. Uh, what? A fantasy world of magic. Monsters and heroes. Yeah, uh, hello? Where is that voice coming from? Heroes like Andar Patron, the star of our story. Yeah, that's me, but what are you talking about? Oh, uh, sorry. We're in a promo for your podcast. Did nobody tell you? What? Your podcast, Have Spellbook Will Travel. Have Spellbook? It's a scripted fantasy comedy audio drama based on the creator's experiences playing tabletop games. To be honest, that sounds pretty boring. Well, it's hilarious and heartwarming and great. Super great. Whatever you say, buddy. Have Spellbook will travel on the Don't Split the Podcast Network. Start the adventure at havespellbook.com or wherever podcasts are available for free.